new season, new manager, but the same old Chelsea. Inability to take our chances and constant lapses in the defense. Right here on Blue Tactics, we break down key events that went down at the bridge. As expected, City lined up in a 4-5-1 formation, switching to a 4-1-4-1 while defending in the final third and to a 4-4-2 all in their defensive half. Chelsea, on the other hand, played out a 4-5-1 system, switching to the same tactics used by Manchester United at the Committee Shield, playing in a 4-2-4 defensive shape when City built up from the back. This worked to a great extent for Manchester United at the Community Shield. But Pep Guardiola was able to bypass this issue by making some tactical tweaks. City were able to get more bodies in the middle of the pack. On the left side of the City attack, City were able to bypass the 4 to 4 defensive shape with Savio dropping into the pockets, occupying the half spaces while Josco Vadio was pushed high and wide. However, Chelsea attacked in a 3 to 5 shape when in possession with Marco Cabrera, Wesley Fofana and Levi Kowil forming a three-man centre-back partnership. Hawaii Malugusto was pushed high and wide, occupying the right side of our attack with Cole Palmer, Nicolas Jackson, Enzo Fernandez and Christopher Nkunku forming a front five in the attacking third. While our 4 defensive shape was sometimes exposed, we also limited City to play loads of long balls down from their defensive half to the attacking third, using outlets such as Erling Haaland and Jeremy Doku. Early on in the match, Jeremy Doku played on the right side of the City attack and he got no joy when he came up against Marco Carrella, which shouldn't come as a surprise to most of us as he had a very impressive tournament back at the Euros. More to come from Marco Carrella. He's really, really living up to his price tag. 20 minutes into the match, Pep Guardiola made some tactical tweaks by switching Savio from the left of the City attack to the right side of the City attack. This tactical switch seemed to be the turning point of the match as both wingers got the better of the opposite fullbacks. Sometimes, when faced on a 1v1 with Malogusto, Jeremy Doku often tends to come inside due to the spaces being left vacant by the Chelsea midfield. Now, how are these spaces left vacant? We can notice from our game against Celtic that the major issue we had was the man marking system, which totally didn't work out, especially at the mid block. Man marking system has its benefits, but it also has its major flaws. The first reason being that when you implement a man marking system, the team has to know when to switch back to a zonal marking and when to restart the man marking phase. Take for instance, City tried to build out from the back. It's okay to go man for man. But once a player is beaten, once the ball has advanced to the middle of the pack in the mid block, it's only logical that the man marking system is put to a temporary pause and switch to a zonal marking because players that are skillful and could beat their man in a 1v1 situation could really expose the man marking system in the mid block. The man marking system could also be exposed when we face teams that use the third man pattern just like and slots Liverpool and the Celtic team we faced in the preseason. As evident in the game, Matteo Kovacic was on the ball and Enzo Fernandez tried to man mark Helen Haaland. This created a vacuum at the middle of the pack. And we all know how good Matteo Kovacic is at dribbling. So he was able to dribble past Moise Caicedo and Enzo Fernandez, resulting in the goal. So overall, defensively, we were very good at City's half. But once we got to the mid block, Man marking system should be switched back to a zonal marking. If I was to compare this game to the preseason game at the US, I say this was a much more improved performance because mistakes that occurred 
back then at the preseason, we are down to a minimal level. We didn't give the ball away at the back more often. One other major issue we had defensively was distribution from our goalkeeper. Robert Sanchez has shown to be a relatively good shot stopper. A question still remains how good can he get this is fit? There are competition for places at the goalkeeping department in the recent signing of Jorgensen. And as games go by, minutes would be allocated to see who turns out to be the ultimate number one at Chelsea. Levi Corey was also brilliant in the first 10 minutes of the game. He made some long through balls to Christopher Nkunku and some line-breaking passes into the middle of the park. Down at the middle of the park, question still remains about how Enzo Fernandez fits into this system. Mauricio Pochettino last season tried him as a number 10 in a much more advanced position. And right here in this game, Enzo Maresca tried the same thing. I really can't fathom how the last two coaches can't seem to see that Enzo Fernandez plays his best football as a number six. Not necessarily a lone number six, but when he has someone by his side, a much more defensive player that can allow him to express himself and sometimes dictates play. Romeo Lavia was very brilliant, but it's going to be a tough battle to see who gets to play alongside Enzo Fernandez because he's such a brilliant player. He has to start every game. Come on, he played for Argentina and he won the World Cup. He was also at his best playing for Benfica in the number six position. So no reason why he cannot succeed at Chelsea when the setup of the team is right. As for Cole Palmer, well, he could be forgiven due to the fact that this was his first game of the season after returning from the Euros. And also that's a played out of position. Cole Palmer is much more restricted when he is asked to play on the right side, except there are players to make runs down on the right for him because he is more effective when played through the middle. And what he also lacked in this game was the the width. We already talked about school Palmer. And we lacked players that could go 1v1, not an overlapping right back, but players that could go 1v1 against defenders. Throughout the game, Josko Vadio wasn't tested in a 1v1 situation. And on the left side of the Chelsea attack, can't really blame Christopher Nkunku for his performance. He's more effective when he's playing behind a striker. There were a few one or two good think of plays with Nicholas Jackson. And when he's in the right position, he could make things happen. Pedro Neto was, for five minutes in the game, magnificent. He added a new bit of spark to the Chelsea attack, making some dancing runs and creating some chances. There's much more to come from this team. We all know the new system is going to take a whole lot of time to work. Departures need to happen as soon as possible. Arrivals, especially a well-proven goal scorer, needs to happen before the transfer window closes. So thanks for watching Blue Tactics. More analysis to come over the course of the season. Hit the like and subscribe button. Thank you.